it and uh, contacted us before. So it's a pleasure to introduce Buda Weber. Uh, Buda comes from Germany and did his both undergraduate and graduate degrees in Tübingen. Uh, he started as a, I guess, structural geologist. Uh, he, he did both his master degree and PhD on material on topic related to Mexico. So he has an early connection to Mexico and worked in southern, in southern Mexico. And for his PhD, he expanded uh, to, to use isotope geochemistry and geochronology, which uh, became his main field uh, until now. Uh, after he graduated in 1998, he came uh, to Mexico first uh, as a sort of a DFG uh, professor and when uh, got a position. And he is now professor, full professor at uh, uh, Ensenada in Cicese, and um, where he set up a a uh, team lab, a uh, clean lab, and also he has a uh, team's uh, mass spectrometer and he set up techniques for samarium, neodymium, and rubidium strontium, uh, as well as a uh, preparation technique for uranium lead analysis. And uh, his main field uh, using um, study of southern Mexico, particularly late uh, Precambrian history of uh, uh, southern Mexico and how it relate uh, to assembly of Gondwana. And uh, since he set up a uh, clean lab and team's lab, he expanded his horizon and started to use uh, stable isotopes as a traces. Uh, he collaborated with a number of people in Germany and also in US for some of his analytical work. And uh, he published over 58 uh, papers. So with this, I pass it to Boda and take it from here. Okay. okay. So I'm sharing the yeah. right screen now. Yeah, perfect. Ready to go. Uh, I think I'm on the wrong wrong screen here. No, no, you're good. We we see what we need to. We see the, the big screen. one. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Andre and and Alex Andre for inviting me for giving this talk here in the virtual seminar on Precambrian geology. So what I'm going to talk today about is uh, mainly about few um, uh, geochronology works problems and challenges we have in for dating Precambrian rocks in Mexico and also isotope techniques that help us to understand a little bit about the history of these rocks in Mexico. So what am I talking about today here? The outline, it's uh, I have uh, two parts here for today. The first one, the Precambrian basement exposures, exposures in Mexico, the Perigondwanan part of Mexico for sure. Uh, overview of Mexico within supercontinent reconstructions. Uh, what is typical Oaxaca for us, the geological features, geochronology and, and isotopes on this. Then a, a few words about new evidence for early Mesoproterozoic rocks in southern Mexico. An early Tonian tectonothermal event from collision to extension. Its correlation with Northwestern South America and what we think with southwestern Scandinavia. Then in the second part, a shorter one here, I will try to tell you a little bit about novel dating approaches by SIMS that reveal reliable crystallization ages for mafic dikes and uh, early Ediacaran mafic magmatism related to final Rodinia breakup and Iapetus opening. So let's look here first on the geological map of Mexico here, quite complicated. Uh, but what I want to emphasize here is only that most of Mexico is covered by tertiary and quaternary volcanic rocks, all this stuff here in red and here in brownish here. And on the eastern side with um, Mesozoic fold and thrust belts. So there's not much space for 
Precambrian rocks, most of them we can find here in southern Mexico in these areas. And uh, this is also the reason then, even because of this, Fernando Ortega and co-workers uh, subdivided the deep continental crust of Mexico in these different areas, even not having any basement outcrops here. It's just uh, a lot of imagination, I would say, and, uh, and uh, data, isotope data from some rocks. And what is Im important here, uh, first of all, there this uh, blue stuff, this area crossing Mexico, which is the Huachita, um, Huachita Suter here. This separates what is North America, uh, Laurentia part of Mexico, where we have indeed Precambrian basements in this area of Sonora and, and Chihuahua. But this is North America, and I would, wouldn't talk about these areas of basement rocks here. Then we have here Baja California, where I am at the moment here, Ensenada, just right here, close to, very close to San Diego. Uh, and further south, the greenish stuff, this is related to Pacific. And all the rest, we would say that these are mostly Peri-Gondwanan terrains, which are related to the Gondwana site prior to the Panchia formation. And there we have a couple of Precambrian basement outcrops. Uh, the most important here is uh, in the Oaxaca state of Mexico, the Oaxacan complex. And uh, this is why Ortega uh, named this entire brownish area here, at least here in the center, he named it back in the 90s, the Oaxaca microcontinent. But uh, this microcontinent is based just on this big basement outcrops here, the Huitznopala gneiss and the Novillo gneiss in northeastern Mexico. And after this, uh, we discovered a few other basement outcrops here in southern Mexico. Uh, and I will talk about these later, which are part of this great block here, including Yucatan, we call this the Maya block. And uh, this was up there north before, prior to the opening of the Gulf of Mexico. So where is the position of Mexico within uh, the Rodinia reconstructions? And I just have chosen two of the many of the Rodinia reconstructions we have seen in the last few decades. Uh, and uh, so there's the one of Karlstrom et al. in 2000. Uh, the easiest way, just uh, continuing the Grenville, Grenville Belt along Canada, US, down the, to the Llano uplift, and then going into Mexico and say, okay, what we have, we have similar mesoproterozoic or maybe similar mesoproterozoic basement outcrops in Mexico called Oaxaca here. And we just uh, add this as the continuation of the same belt uh, in the Rodinia reconstruction. Another, the now most popular one of the reconstructions is that of Lee et al. 2008. And he put Oaxaca here, the microcontinent, in between the Amazonia craton and Baltica on this side and not connected to the Granville Belt over here. And this is actually the reconstruction that we favor too. Uh, after all these years, we worked on the different basement outcrops of Mexico. Okay, so uh, here we see the distribution of Perigondwan and terrains with uh, in, in, uh, in uh, pink here with the darker mesoproterozoic basement inliers of Mexico here, the Oaxaca, Huitznopala, Novillo, and the new ones, Kichikobi, El Triunfo, where we are working. And they are quite similar uh, to the Perigondwanan terrains and basement inliers we find in Northwestern South America, mainly in Colombia, the Garzon, Santander, Santa Marta, and, uh, and a few others. Uh, they were for long, uh, interpreted as being uh, moved terrains, maybe from further south or somewhere else, until uh, Ivanez said, all oh, they discovered uh, uh, the local Putumayo basement on, on the northwestern Amazon Craton as being out of tone basement with uh, similar ages and uh, typical uh, petrology we find everywhere in these basements. 
And so if we make the reconstruction for the um, Pangea in the late Permian, we have to accommodate all these pieces together here south of the Bachita Marathon belt. And this is what we are finding here with the basement in Laos. We connect now to mainly to Amazonia and to a role between Amazonia and Baltica in the past. Okay, so let's go first uh, to introduce to what we think is typical Oaxaca about. And so we go first to the Oaxaca, to the Oaxacan complex here in the central Oaxaca state. Oaxaca city is up here and it goes about 200 kilometers south down close where it's uh, uh, cut by this left lateral falls uh, close to the Pacific coast here uh, east of Puerto Escondido. And uh, so an area was mapped here by Carlos Schulz a, cu a couple of years ago. And uh, this shows quite well and easy what is typical Oaxaca, Oaxaca about. So we find uh, lots of anorthosite, massive anorthosites in Oaxaca, surrounded by associated rocks like chanokites, but also endobites, strontiumites, and more monsonitic rocks here. And uh, they intruded into uh, migmatites and supracrustal rocks here in this area, which are mostly of arc affinity, chemical arc affinity, and uh, usually older. So these are a few photos here of these strongly deformed anorthosites with ilmenite lenses in them. And uh, what's interesting also, sometimes you find these uh, hook folds that show that these anorthosites and associated rocks were strongly deformed. So they probably intruded prior to the main deformation event in uh, the Oaxacan basement. Interesting also in the Pluma Hidalgo area, we are, uh, we can find these Nelsonites with a lot of rutile in it. Actually, this is from a rutile mine that was mined for this mineral for some decades. It's now closed, but it's one of the few rutile mines, I think, in the world uh, that uh, take this mineral. Okay, um, interesting discovery made by Schulze in his PhD work is depicted here in this PT. Path. Uh, so he discovered in mafic gabroic blocks inside the anorthosites still uh, relict mineral assemblages where he could calculate that these blocks uh, came from depths that correspond to about 13 kilobars. And then uh, they came up with the anorthosite that changed the compositions up there to the intrusion depths, which is somewhere here. We don't know exactly where, but then they went down again to granulite facious metamorphism around 990 million years. That we, is the main metamorphic event we know now from almost everywhere in the Oaxacan uh, complex and then went back again. So it came from melting of the lower, lower crust up to the middle crust and went down to uh, middle lower crust again. Okay, so uh, I would show you, sorry, that went too fast, a few um, yes, here we are, a few dating attempts on uh, these anorthosite series rocks. The main problem of anorthosite is always that we usually don't find any zircon in anorthosite. So if we want to date them, we go to the associated rocks here, like the quartz monsonite or the endobite. And uh, so in, in that study, we did uh, different dating approaches here, both with ID TIMS in that time and with laser ablation multi-collector ICPMS that we did in Arizona Laser Chrome Center in, in Tucson with George Gerrels. So what we find out on here, even if you look at these zircons here, they look uh, pretty homogeneous. And anyway, different spot points here analyzed, we see here in red, they spread between about 950 and go up to almost uh, 1150 million years. Uh, anyway, we can calculate a 207, 206 uh, mean age of that with about one, 1006 plus minus which is probably related 
to the anorthosite type rocks, the AMC rocks in this area, but they are quite a mixture of different ages in these zircons. The same goes for the, for the TIMS uh, analysis, always shown in yellow here. So we see on the, the lowermost side here an intercept age of 970 something that corresponds probably to the age of the metamorphism. Similar on this sample here, the endobite, even there are some small inherited cores on it and all the rest is uh, the later crystallization age. Uh, we find almost the same from uh, anorthosites in another outcrop of Mexico in, in Huitznopala, where we see also we took um, a gabroic piece, a gabroic uh, uh, blob within this anorthosite, because here we can find zircons, in the anorthosite we don't, but we see that in this block here we find zircons with all, all the cores, and they spread also from about 950 up to over 1200 million years. So anyway, we can try to find a Concordia age here, a little bit above 1000, maybe 1015 million years that corresponds to the intrusion age of this AMC rocks. But anyway, it's uh, not a perfect age that we will expect. What's interesting here about that these data show clearly that zircons from the AMC rocks retain age information from the lower crust where the magma was generated or during the essence. So it's not just the magma coming from the mantle or somewhere, it's mo mostly melted lower crust, what we see. Okay, the next dating attempts come from the Magdalena migmatite, calgalkaline protolist uh, that are surrounded uh, the, uh, surrounding the anorthosite rocks in the area. And uh, we see here clearly that these are these are granitic uh, protoliths and they are folded. And then uh, we, we see uh, migmatites here, leucosomes that are folded in these rocks. There were, was some melting event going on at some times. And finally, all these rocks together are metamorphosed and the granulite facies later. So, and if we look at the, on the zircons here, we see they, <clears throat> they spread along the Concordia again from 900 something up to 1250 million years. If we try to do it by TIMS, as in former days, everybody did, we have no clear result. The single grain analysis, even with its single grains, they are always below the Concordia and we don't have any reliable age of these, of these rocks. Anyway, if we do it this uh, with the spot analysis, at least we can see uh, on 207, 206 ages, if we take the average, we can say, okay, the intrusion age of the protholist is best defined by about 1217 plus minus something million years. But it's worth to look um, a little bit on the, on the details of the zircons. This is how they look like. And uh, we did these analyses on uh, with with uh, channel trons for e for each uh, lead isotope and makes us possible to do 10 microns micrometer spot size here so on, on the individual grains we did up to 20 spots here we see in some grains it's pretty easy like that one so we have an old car with about 1200 million years and an overgrowth that corresponds to the granulite facies. And here in that one, we see all the complexity of these zircons in this area. In between these 1200 and let's say 980 million years or something, they happen first the intrusion here, the red, red dots. So uh, this old core was mostly dissolved by a later event with dark grayish CL image, this means with higher uranium contents. And this is probably the event where the rock was migmatized, where we had water in the system, where uranium can get into the system. And later we have the granulite facies around it with the clear light CL images. And this indicates there's almost no uranium there because this was dry as typical for all the granulite facies. We have almost no uranium in these uh, late overgrowths. And then last but not least, these small cracks here, they come from decompression during the uplift where 
the, the zircons cracked and were refilled by later zircons, so it makes the things even more complicated. So if we dissolve all this, uh, this zircon all together, we get a mixture of a total of, of four different events here. So this is what making things so complicate and all within a, a relatively small time interval for the time we are looking in the, in the past. Okay, so now let's go quickly to the Witznopalagnes, this area here, a small outcrops here north of Mexico City. Uh, it was mapped by Lawler et al. in the late 90s. And uh, here I've seen paragnises here in the southern part, and here some orthognises. And these up there, these are the anorthosites I just showed you the data from. So uh, here are chanokites and, and orthognises here in that area. And they are interesting because there it was the first time we found uh, some older circles. Even on that one, they go back with, the, with an upper intercept age of a little bit more than 1400 million years, even for the other samples. And what we see here clearly, this is not just inheritance, that most of, the, of this zircon grain has the same age. They have some overgrowth, but it's clearly the, the most prominent event here is about 1400 million years. And in the other sample here, we even get an inherited component of something older. It's not much, but, but there are some older uh, inherited cores in it. And the main igneous event, it's also the same age here, 1412 million years plus minus. So this was the first evidence from Mexico from Circon. We had it uh, before that from Samar Neodymium, ages two, that we have the, the igneous events started around 1400 million years in the in Oaxaca. So looking now here first on the right hand side on the initial hafnium isotopes of these grains and we just go to that sample we seen here with the 1400 million years. These are some individual grains and this is ID isotope dilution analysis of the individual grains that were also analyzed by, by TIMS. Uh, not laser ablation. So, and we can see that the one with no inherited canes and 1400 million year age plots on the evolution line, on the one crustal evolution line where all the typical Oaxaca migmatites, I've shown you from the Magdalena migmatite zircons and the AMC rocks plot on. So it seems what we say it's typical Oaxaca, it's all on the same crustal evolution line and comes probably from the same magmatism without a without lot of connection with an older continent. Where we see this inherited uh, zircon grains in this 1.4 giga year old rock, in the other one where we have the inherited parts, we get only the lower isotope, hafnium isotope ratios. And compare this to even to the paragnises here, which are not even not very lower than uh, the main the typical rocks, there is no uh, major input from the continents in uh, within Oaxaca, Oaxaca at this time. These are some samples from, uh, from Colombia, which are a little bit lower, but not much. Interesting here is also one point, what I would say is interesting for people working with hafnium isotopes. Some zircons of this rock here that give younger ages have exactly the same isotope ratio than uh, the older ones too. So they plot on the same line, means that these are recrystallized zircons. And this is also the reason that why, why I like much better for hafnium isotopes using the isotope ratios instead of epsilon hafnium, because this corresponds to epsilon hafnium of plus 10 or so, and this of minus five. So, and but it's, exactly the same isotope ratio here. Okay, so uh, doing just come some uh, compilation of the reported ages from Oaxaca, and we see here the most prominent peak for the most ages correspond to the granulite facious metamorphism in Oaxaca, which is around plus minus, let's say 990 million years ago. AMC rocks intruded earlier and the few good ages we have, there are not many, say the intrusion of most of the AMC rocks 
is about 1,020 million years ago. Then we have some younger pegmatites that intruded uh, during, during uplift, uplift uh, decompression melting, uh, and uh, these, these large, uh, well, let's say, age spread for the magmatic arc magmatite with the main uh, peak here around 1,200 million years, but this spread between, let's say, 1,300 and 1,100, and then we have the magmatization, and some profiles that go back to 1.4 uh, billion years. Uh, finally, I put together also the Samarium neodymium garnet whole rock ages from Oaxaca. And this is interesting here is that most of them uh, are around 920 and 800, between 920 and 880 million years. And this uh, indicates, considering a closure temperature of at least 650 degrees, there are a lot of discussion about maybe it's much higher, that uh, all these rocks were in a lower crustal level at least for about 80 million years before major uplift happened. Okay, so the evolution here so, so far at the moment, so we have crust formation and the juvenile, juvenile arc, or a Hakia arc here in the Sun Ocean in front of Amazonia, Maybe then uh, this arc collided with Amazonia at some point, uh, producing a fringing arc system here along Amazonia. And then we uh, probably, we get some extension here to make it possible to get the intrusion of the anorthosite rocks prior to the final collision. We say this collision was with Baltica and Oaxaca went down to the lower crust where we get it all together under granulite facious metamorphism. And it took quite a long until it came up uh, to, um, to higher crustal levels again. Okay, so in the, in the next part here, I would like to take you to the to Pre-Cambrian inliers of the Chiapas Massive complex. The Chiapas Massive, right here on the southernmost edge of Mexico, close to Guatemalan border. Uh, this area is known mainly by its Permian batholith rocks. It was Permian batholith map for many years, and nobody uh, worried about uh, the older inliers that are uh, at least in the, or mostly in the southeasternmost part of this area. And that's we are working right now. And uh, most of this work is from my uh, PhD student, Tatiana Valencia here. And so we go first to this area where we did some detailed mapping. And uh, what we found out here, uh, all in red, are the, the Permian uh, igneous rocks here. And in orange, these are basement rocks, mostly amphibolite, that we discovered already a couple of years ago, but they are uh, mainly affected by the Permian metamorphic event. And now what we could find here in this, in this purple area, here, uh, looking at the Samarium neodymium model ages, that all these model ages here are between 2.0 and mainly 1.8, a billion years, and they are definitely and significantly older than all the neodymium model ages we know from typical Oaxaca. So this seems it's really a piece of older crust here, and uh, which uh, is something new for southern Mexico. We have never seen this in southern Mexico before, and uh, for sure we uh, did now also some some zircon analysis and the zircon of these rocks they are also pretty complex because most of them suffered the Permian metamorphism too but they are at least this sample here is very interesting because uh, we have just a bifid uh, uh, distribution of, of zircons here there's the upper intercept age or the older grains here that show that the protolith age of this gneiss here is uh, defined by 1550 million years. And this is, uh, well, definitely older than all we could find from Oaxaca so, so far. So uh, this proves really that we have an older 
uh, crustal slice here in the area older than Oaxaca with older um, model ages uh, and with older zircon prophylate ages. Also, the other samples even not so pronounced. We get always, always uh, the uppermost zircons, the oldest zircon grains around 1500 million years. These old dark uh, uh, cores here also in, in that sample. And uh, the second thing that we find, uh, a metamorphic event, and if we look at, at these rocks in field, uh, they are also migmatized, migmatized, and we think that uh, the anatectic, the high-grade metamorphic event is that one we can see here with all these zircons that grew here, the typical metamorphic, uh, not magmatic zoning, uh, showing a metamorphic event in average between, on all these samples, between 950 and 930 million years. So this is younger than the granulite facies event in Oaxaca, and we don't have any relics of granulite facies in this area. So it seems this is a different, not only a different prophylate, but also a different metamorphic event. So next we go uh, further south here to a, a complex we, we, we name now the El Triunfo complex, just quickly. This is even more complicated here, uh, just close to the Guatemalan border. So we have here a lot of left lateral fault systems here related to the, uh, to the plate boundary in this area. But this is um, an, a zone where Alex Cisneros, he mapped a lot of anorthosites in this area here and also anorthosites over here. So they were separated by this fault, probably one complex that was priorly together. And uh, so we have some basement rocks here in blue, which we think they are pre-Cambrian, covered by meta sedimentary rocks. And we will talk about these in, a, in just in a few minutes. And uh, they, all they are intruded by Ordovician granites. And the main metamorphic event in the area is also medium to high grade and it's Ordovician. But anyway, uh, we look here at this gneiss here, the so-called Chipilin gneiss, with the strong folding here and even some seems they had some uh, sheath folds developed. This Chipilin gneiss, uh, if we compare it with the other zircons here from the bluish stuff where we find pre cambrian rocks. They, they, with the H's here, they look pretty much like what we typically observe from the anorthosite sweet rocks. Maybe it's related, maybe it was a Chanokite in former times, we don't know. But these here are all metamorphic zircons here, and these metamorphic zircons are younger than that one's over there. So we, if we compare these data here, we see uh, from all these different rocks here, a beefy distribution of the zircon ages, intrusion ages around 1017, 1005 million years, and some later overprint in these zircons that we see in these metamorphic zircons is the only present uh, metamorphic event clearly defined with an upper intercept age here at 900. 19 plus minus 13 million years. So this is a different kind of metamorphism. So we look here again on hafnium isotopes first. So these are the basement rocks here and anorthosite. These are whole rock analyses here. And we see that these, the hafnium isotopes of these zircons are, have much lower isotope composition. So this and other, they are from another crust even an older crust, but even the, the zircon ages are much younger from a different event. And more importantly, we did also oxygen isotopes on these zircons. So we find here um, uh, uh, that the oxygen isotopes uh, we see here on this side, just uh, uh, quickly here in the between five and five point C delta uh, per mil delta units. These are the mental values. If we have some recycling, we get always, always more positive uh, delta-18 oxygen isotope compositions in zircons. And the only way to get lower isotope composition uh, is if the zircon is crystallized from hypothermally altered rocks. And this is possible, for example, in a deep fault 
or in a detachment force where water can get in during metamorphic uh, crystallization of these zircons of this gneiss here. And this is interesting because this implies that all these happens at a much higher crustal level. Okay, so just looking here at the, at the comparison quickly between what we find in Mexico, here the, the age to the back, this compil compilation was done by, by uh, Tatiana Valencia. And uh, so it's, we can see quite well here uh, the different ages and rock types of Oaxaca and uh, the Putumaya province of uh, Northwestern South America. So if we put them all together here now, including also what we newly find here, it's uh, really very similar to what we find in Telemarchia in the, in the Svico Norwegian belt. Also with the younger event about 920, what we say now it's maybe the Dallin phase, and all the uh, most of the other events, even the 1.5 billion year uh, igneous events that are present in Telemarchia quite well. So, and the, uh, the adjusted model now says, okay, we can go further back. Uh, we look at Nuna here, no, no idea if Amazonia was involved somehow, but we may have had some subduction zones either there or that. If we say it was the uh, Amazonia side, we can include them here on that side of Oaxaca, then the final collision that we have seen earlier, and then what we see now between 950 and 920, the extension, uh, detachment force, orogenic collapse, and the formation of migmatites and, uh, and zircons within uh, detachments for that is what we see now from uh, Chiapas. Okay, so uh, the conclusions here of the first part, perhaps so we have new early mesoproterozoic profiles having older continental sources that indicate a different crustal size or block involved in the basement of southeastern Mexico. The similarities in timing and isotopic composition for Precambrian inliers from Mexico, Northern Andes, and Putumayo really call for an inclusive redefinition redefic 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 of Oaxaca. Maybe we should call it just Oaxaca Putumayo origin. Then the Newtonian te tectonothermal event, uh, including Anatexis here as uh, from altered rocks and differs clearly from the Oaxaca granulite. The late Newtonian event is probably related to orogenic collapse and ext extension, similar to the Valen phase of the Sweco Norwegian belt. So if I still have a few minutes to go, I go to the second part here about uh, new dating approaches that reveal early Adiacra and Mafic magmatism. So we are now on the end of Rodinia here, Laurentia, Baltica, and Amazonia together. And uh, there are several papers that show that a large igneous pr province called Central Iapetus Magmatic Province, which with a lot of expressions here in Laurentia and Baltica, especially Egerson dikes here in Norway and long range dikes in uh, uh, northeastern North America, uh, indicate the uh, a large igneous province and opening between the, these three continents here. Uh, this event about 615 million years ago was never reported from uh, Amazonia before. And if Oaxaca was placed right here, we should expect that we find at least something of, from this event. So let's go back here to the El Triunfo complex quickly. So we see here the meta sedimentary rocks covering all these basements. And uh, we find quite a lot of uh, mafic dikes with, uh, much, uh, uh, with much younger hafnium isotopes and chemistry of, of EMORP chemistry. And uh, the meta sedimentary rocks here, they are, these dikes are in these meta sediments. And my former PhD student, Rene Gonzalez, he tried to uh, look on the on the, on the calcite marbles here and find out that the positional age is most probably around 600 million years where these dikes intruded into. So, but uh, there might be there's some evidence for central Iapetus magmatic province, but how to date in uh, these 
Mafic dikes here, there has no magmatic zircon. If Badeliite, it's definitely gone. So what Alex Cisneros found out in this area, in the anorthosites, that around Root Island, also Ilmenite, we find small zircon grown as zircon coronas around these rutile. Well, since rutile contains a lot of zirconium grown by high temperatures, as in anorthosites, let's say 1100 degrees, if there is a later stage event, the zircon exhausts from these minerals and by another uh, sequence of metamorphic reactions, these zircons grow. So the idea is, uh, if, if these mafic rocks intruded into the anorthosite, is it possible to date these intrusions by zircon growth directly at the contact between the, between the dike and the anorthosite? So we took a couple of samples on the, from these contacts and uh, dated these very small uh, zircons by secondary ion microprobe in Heidelberg. And what uh, came out here, they are quite complex. Again, the grayish zircons are the metamorphic zircons from the Ordovician event, but they are these small cores that are the original zircons that grew during dike intrusion. And they give an age of about 615 million years. We did it also in situ on a thin section, these small zircon grains. And again, not so perfect, but they have age also around 608 million years plus minus 12. So this is uh, evidence that these, these dikes uh, really intruded in Ediacaran times. Okay, this was recently published here. And then from north, northeastern Mexico, the Novillo complex, we find exactly the same dikes there. They are not, metam not so much metamorphosed here. And they intruded here, not anorthosites. So there's not the way to date them in the similar way in the, in the uh, host rock. So we need to find something to date in the dike. And what we did there are um, micro badalii dating. So to separate badalii is uh, quite complicated, as you might, as you might know. And uh, so we uh, defined these or we looked for these micro it's mostly about 10 microns big in a thin section, and also dated these by a secondary ion microprobe here, where we can really try to do very small areas of these um, badaliites. And we find out pretty much the same. Uh, intrusion age of the dike, 619 million years, Anyway, it's never perfect, all the red stuff here, the greenish here, uh, there's a secondary event. And which one is the intrusion event? If we look closer, we see the, the younger badaliites are recrystallized partly to zircon. So there's a later stage event here. And this is most probably a mixed age between a later event and the intrusion between the badaliite and the later stage zircon. So finally, the conclusions here, the new age dating proves Emor magmatisms of the central Iapetus magmatic province in Oaxaca as part of Amazonia during the Neoproterozoic and contemporaneous dikes realms in Laurentia, Baltica and Amazonia now imply a single large igneous province across all three continents around 620 million years ago. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention. That was my talk to, for today, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have. Thank you very much, Vito. That was really nice. Well done. Um, now, as always, we're going to transition into the, the discussion and question session. So anybody who has a question, you can ask it in a couple of ways. You can raise your hand virtually, type a star into the chat. Or if you don't have a microphone or would like to not ask your question verbally, I can ask it myself if you uh, type it out in the chat. So with that, if anybody would like to ask a question, this is your time.
Oh, hey there. Like David Evans is ready to ask a question. Thank you, Bodo. That was really Hi, great. David. Hi, nice to see nice you. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, so uh, first, let me put my hand down. Um, all right. So, um, you know, I've been working on this uh, big global model with Bruce Eglinton for a while, and we've been struggling to account for these Central American terrains. Um, and one of the things that we've struggled with is um, where to put them in the early to mid Paleozoic, which would be a stepping stone toward what you just described. Um, and with the dextral shear that accompanied uh, Pangaea formation uh, in the Carboniferous, um, we were wondering whether it would seem reasonable to have uh, Oaxacaia restore um, next, uh, to sort of shift laterally, so it would be next to the Peruvian margin of the Andes. Um, for for the uh, any time older than about 300 million years, uh, 330 or so. Do you have uh, any opinions about uh, about that, which would be like, a, as I said, a stepping stone toward these earlier reconstructions? Okay, uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, I remember Victor Ramos always told me that he places uh, Oaxaca close to the Peruvian margin or even further south. Hmm. Uh, well, I think uh, a, a big point uh, here forward was really the discovery of the Putumayo basement on the, um, the, the Western Amazonian crater in Colombia, because this is most probably in situ, I would say. So I think we cannot move it far away from here. I really would keep it more or less where it is. And uh, as, you, as you all know, the major problem of these reconstructions is probably the size of Oaxaca and all these species together. We don't know how big it is. And uh, well, it was not the theme today. We need to think about what happened uh, after Panchia. And when we have the, the opening of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean region where all these basement in layers was broken into small pieces. And we don't know how small these pieces are. So I'm really, I'm even thinking about we should to overcome this big Oaxaca microcontinent. Uh, maybe it's we, what we are seeing, it's at much smaller pieces and in between there is nothing. We really don't know if all the basement is Precambrian there. We just have the small spots and some, uh, some few uh, xenolites from, from volcanic rocks. And the other thing that uh, we were working on together with Jim Pindle, the, the, and recently is that we think uh, about a lot of crustal extension during the uh, Triassic and Jurassic. So if we have the, the, the big orogen, Wachita Marathon, like a Himalayan type orogen, and later we have uh, maybe 50% or 70% or of crustal extension and just move all this crust, this thickened crust, to a to a thinner crust in the in the in the Triassic by a basin and range event. We get most of the overlap between Mexico and and northwestern Colombia accommodated. So it's probably even not necessary to move the block so much around. Uh, but anyway, as long as we don't have really good uh, uh, paleomag data, which is almost impossible due to all these metamorphic events that went on later, uh, it's, it's very difficult to say. Good, thank you. All right, uh, Aki Johansson said he would like to make a comment. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Okay, you can hear me now? Okay. Yeah, we can hear yeah, very you. Good. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to make as a, a comment as a representative for Baltica and Sweden here. Uh, I don't believe in the Lietal reconstruction in the way that Waxakia was squeezed in, in between Baltica and Amazonia, because I think Baltica and Amazonia formed one coherent block, both in Colombia and Rodinia as I've written about in my Samba reconstruction. So I don't think it, it becomes problematic to squeeze in Waxakia in between Baltica and Amazonia. And there is no evidence for a Grenville Age or Yen 
except for the second region, when you go further along the margin of, of, of Baltica down towards Ukraine, you don't have any signs of any collision and, and not on the Amazonian side in northeast Amazonia either. The Ital drew some kind of belt there, but that is underneath the, uh, the or Orinoco Basin, so I don't think there is any real solid evidence for that. But rather, I would suggest that maybe that was what David Evans was also say, saying that Waxakia could have been, say, to the northwest of, slightly northwest outboard of Amazonia and to the southwest outboard of, of Baltica as a kind of, yeah, a bit west of, of, of present day Fenoscandia, because it seems to be mainly younger then. So it became squeezed in between, on the one side, uh, Baltic and Amazonia, and on the other side, uh, Laurentia then in, in the in the Rodinia collision. And then when Rodinia separated, it, it became stuck to Amazonia then. So uh, that would be my suggestion to have it kind of a little bit west and outward of, of the Amazonia Baltica margin. Yep. So, so, uh, uh, back to the question. I, I've seen your talk last week on the ICP. Okay. <laughs> yes, six o'clock in the morning was that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, what about Telemarkia? So, I don't know the, the geology of, of Scandinavia, but I think there are so many similarities, many aspects in metamorphism, and now what the what we see in the 920 event that is pretty much similar to what uh, you have in, in Telemarkia during this high temperature, ultra high temperature event. And even we don't know if we probably the recently discovered anorthosites, we don't know the age of these anorthosites and I'm not sure if they maybe are around, also around 930, we don't have an age yet of this, maybe it's difficult. So uh, there are a lot of similarities between uh, what we see there in Mexico and, and uh, the Telemarkia terrain. Uh, what, is, isn't there an option to bring these together? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I think, but then you should, I think you should put Waxakia a little bit to the west of Telemarkia, just as a cont continuation. It was sitting somewhere out where right now the North Sea is, but not, not uh, in between Baltic and Amazonia, uh, say, well, somewhere where it's now northern Germany or Poland or somewhere, because then it doesn't fit the second region geology. Uh, you should put it a little bit more outboard to the west instead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have the collision between between Baltic and, and Laurentia there instead. Also because if you if you think about the second region or region, you don't see any collision from this southwest or so, it's all tectonic transport and collision from west to northwest, so collision with Laurentia. It's difficult to fit in collision with Amazonia in, in the second region or region, I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah well, there's definitely... Uh, I, I don't know how we can solve this question one day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's no, no single proof for so for anything, <laughs> you just have to put the evidence together and think and discuss. And Bodo, uh, Dave, David also made a comment. He said, uh, we also need to account for a shortest block somewhere in there. Yes, uh, Chortis. Well, Chortis, most of Chortis is Honduras. It's still a no-go area. Uh, nobody went in there the last uh, decades. We should do, but uh, it's uh, it's probably very difficult. Uh, even we are often in troubles when we go to Chiapas and other areas. It's uh, it, it's not easy to work there. The Chortis is still a place where we don't know what happened with the basement, where it's located at even the ages. There's nothing really known about that. And um, at the moment, it's still difficult to go there. Kanoskandia is safer. <laughs> oh, we have a government crisis right now. You're pretty safe. So Lyle Harris is ready to ask a question here now. Yes, no, I was just uh, uh, wondering about the metamorphic conditions. Maybe uh, I missed it, but in the, uh, you know, the reconstructions that uh, you've made, you're having both Amazonia and Baltica overthrusting 
uh, the area of your study. And I'm just wondering if you've got the uh, metamorphic evidence uh, for high pressure rocks to support this crustal uh, doubling that you're proposing. <laughs> Uh, well, we, no, we have uh, not for a crustal dub doubling, I would say. Uh, we at least got, um, well, if I showed at the beginning down to 13 kilobars, that's uh, the, okay. the deepest part we got. We never got eclogite facious in, oh. in, in Oaxaca. Uh, this, this is just, uh, well, we see it, it has to be a, a, a collisional event, continent, continental collision. And uh, we have the evidence that something were thrust above these these basement rocks, but we don't have any evidence from uh, high pressure rocks eclogites. Unfortunately, uh, no such old eclogites. The only eclogites in Mexico are Carboniferous. Now it just seems unusual as well that you're having everything else over thrusting uh, your area, whereas elsewhere in the Granville province we see that these high grade gneisses are. Uh, themselves uh, overthrust upon Archean uh, rocks, whereas here you seem to have, you know, these Grenvillian rocks uh, down to the, the Moho. I'm just wondering if the geophysical data uh, supports that you uh, don't have uh, these metamorphic rocks, uh, Lochness, on uh, either an Archean or a Paleoproterozoic uh, crust or upper mantle. Oh. Well, the, the only thing what we can say is uh, we can uh, uh, we can work with uh, with the isotope data, and uh, we don't see any really older uh, inheritance in some of these rocks. Uh, so no influence of any Archean or older rocks in Mexico. Nowhere, at least in southern in southern Mexico, uh, from the geophysical side. Well. All these um, all these basement in in layers were later uh, involved in later stage Phanerozoic uh, uh, events and uh, the Laramide collision and all this stuff. So the, uh, these are all crustal pieces thrust over uh, other rocks uh, in later stage phases. So I think it's it's no way to find this out in in Mexico. It's a more poetic this interpretation, I would say. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Do you have any other uh, questions lined up? Yeah, just maybe a quick question for Bode uh, about oxygen isotopes and zircons. And um, you inferred uh, a major fault of rust based on it. Uh, sometimes uh, when intrusion intrusions can generate uh, hydrothermal cells and uh, incorporate meteoric waters and result in this highly negative or shift to negative oxygen isotope values. Do you think you might have any igneous intrusions that created this aureole of alteration around them rather than inferring the fault? Okay, this is a this is a good question, really. Well, what we see is um, in the around these these nine hundred forty million event that we have anataxy, so there is uh, some melting going on. We probably we may have also intrusion at this time. They can involve hydrothermal waters from the surface. So we need at some point we need water from the surf surface involved in the magmatism to get the oxygen isotopes to these lower values. So since I haven't seen really intrusions of the ACE, ex ex except the, the, uh, the migmatites, but we see a, a present day very important fault in the area. So uh, one of my ideas how this can be generated. It goes towards, a, towards a, a major structure, crustal structure, because I think that this structure was re, uh, reactivated several times afterwards. I didn't talk about this today, but there is a, a, a fault or a, 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 a shear zone going along the Pacific coast. And this is a shear zone that crosses from there to the Istmo de Tehuantepec to, to the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the line where all the Gulf of Mexico was opened. 
And this shear zone was then reactivated by the present day left lateral shear zone that separates North America from, from the Caribbean, Caribbean plate. And this is exactly where we find the anorthosites. The anorthosites are on one side and on the other side of the fault. And right there is where we find these thircons with the low oxygen isotopes. I think really that this may be, we have no further proof on it, that this may be an, an old reactivated fault. And this tends me to say that it's probably uh, the reason why I say, okay, there might be a, a structure. And even so it's a little bit later or 20 million years later than the an, an act, uh, uh, the migmatites in the, in the mountains. So, well, there's work to do and it's complicated, but I maybe that's uh, the better way to interpret this is on a, on a, a detachment fault. And there are papers about this, uh, geophysical papers that can say that this is possible to get the, the, the water down uh, over 10 kilometers below the surface. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll give uh, give everybody a few more minutes to, or uh, you know, several seconds to decide if we have more questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, but uh, this was really good, and uh, we really did finish in a good amount of time, even with some really good good discussion. So this was. This was really nice. So thank you so much. Um, with that, thanks everybody for showing up for our first seminar of the summer. Again, we'll be doing bi-weekly, so we'll see you all in two weeks. Uh, and um, until then, have have uh, some some good summertime. And enjoy Goldschmidt, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Enjoy Goldschmidt. Yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Bodo. Bye. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Mm -hmm.